real life. Superpowers. Up in the sky, it's a bird. It's a plane. Gentlemen, we can rebuild him. We have the technology. It's alive. Real life. Superpowers. Hey, we're here with Yariv Bash, co-founder and CEO of Flytrex, which we'll talk all about, and founder of Space AL, which is a very cool non-profit, Israeli non-profit, that's actually probably going to land an Israeli spaceship on the moon. Yariv, what's up? It's not probably. We're going to land an unmanned spacecraft on the moon. Yeah, I wanted, I wanted to hear you say that. <laughs> so how are you? Uh, not bad, not bad. What are you up to these days? Uh, mostly Flytrex. It's an unmanned uh, drone company we basically we're doing drone deliveries the uh the promise that amazon uh, is working on so we're going to supply that to everyone who's not amazon it's a huge market and currently we're working already deployed in iceland and we're now working with the faa on a pilot in north carolina amazing and how is that going so far uh, not bad i expect that by the end of this year you're going to see uh, hamburgers flying above people's head in uh, A small town in North Carolina. Really? By the end of this year? Yes. Uh, so it's very much back to the future. Like people in some places in the world already, and pretty much thanks to you, are walking uh, down the street and seeing flying drones delivering stuff? Well, actually, they, they fly at roughly 70 to 100 meters or 200 to 300 feet. So you can barely see them or hear them. Uh, so, but, but once they start descending to uh, lower the, uh, the order to the ground, That's where you, when you can see them and uh, probably hear them as well. You, you guys are so aloof about this. So, like, like we're gonna, we're at, so uh, just to, to picturize this, this mm -hmm. is how North Carolina is going to be look like, okay? It's going to be <laughs> hundreds, thousands? How much are we talking well, about? Well, depending. It's a small town. It's a 25,000 people town. So we're going to start with a, just a few drones. Okay. And they're going to fly around with like packages, let's say mm -hmm. what size, like a, a burger. You said burger, but. Yeah, it's uh, the uh, the box, the, the current box for packages is 15 by 11 by 7 inches or 28 What's by... What's that? Uh, like that's like a very, object? that's a huge uh, a shoe box. Shoe box, cool. Uh, basically, you can take food for up to a small family in it, hmm. up to six and a half pounds or three kilograms. Uh, we're working on a larger version now, uh, but currently you can take six pounds to distances of up to three miles or five kilometers which covers uh, pretty much more, most of the town. It is incredible. So wait, wait how does this work on a, on a technical level? Is there someone manning the drones? Oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> at the end, we, we have to compete with, a, with a, you know, a, a someone who's 16 years old on a scooter. So it has to be cheaper than that. So basically, a Flytrex operator can now operate a fleet of drones in real time on his own. So the system is quite, it's not really autonomous, it's automatic. Uh, all the operator has to do is uh, insert a new package, replace the batteries if they've been depleted, and just, you know, press a green button, and we take care of the rest. Uh, we do the fleet management, the logistics side, the drone takes off, flies towards the destination, the customer receives a notification, he can see the drone in real time, flying towards him. Once the drone hovers above his backyard, all he has to do is press that he's there at the location approving delivery. The drone lowers to 15 meters or so, or... Uh, something like 40, 50 feet, lowers the package on a wire to the ground. We do not land near the end customer. And then the drone flies back to be, uh, you know, reinstalled with a new package. And like planes in the sky and birds? So birds tend to avoid the drone. We, we fly at uh, 50 kilometers per hour or 30 miles per hour or so. So birds just run away and we fly below the, the altitude of demand flight so it's uh we're segregated from the uh the others got it hunger games that's that's hunger games right, that's the future why, why hunger games because i only saw it in hunger games <laughs> i haven't seen the drone. Uh -huh. i saw the amazon commercial but i've never seen the drone come with a burger yet so you you can I'm fly excited. to Reykjavik in iceland and we're now deployed in 23 locations around the city uh, we're now walking on the backyards and you can just order your sushi or hamburger to any one of those points and get it within 15 minutes instead of an hour and a half. Wait, uh, Iceland? You said Iceland, right? How'd yeah, you, the you capital of Iceland. Iceland. Yeah. So it's a mixture of uh, the uh, of finding a really good partner, local partner, mm -hmm. and the regulator that's willing to experiment and to give you a, you know, to, to work with you to, to find a way to make that work. 
wow, so that's very random for me. Like, so like you found that regulator in Iceland just by... So we, we got, you know, leads from all over the world and we, we qualify them. We see that the partners are good, that they're strong and they, they have the problem. They have a problem of last mile or on-demand delivery. And then we, we start looking at the uh, regulatory framework in that country. We've got a few advisors uh, that are helping us with that. And once we saw that we have a strong partner in Iceland and that the regulatory framework can enable us to fly beyond visual line of sight, that's one of the scariest things for, uh, uh, for drone operators, uh, and to fly above people, above a city, we realized that there's a, a, a great potential in, uh, in Iceland. And, and, and the security risk, is there, is there any, like, uh, on drones flying on... I know everybody's scared. I've never seen a drone fall. Okay? Mm-hmm. I have a drone. It comes back when the battery is depleted. I see that. Exactly. But is the, there any danger so at all? Currently, we, we're using... Uh, we, we're a bit like FedEx. We do not produce the trucks. We just procure them. Uh, so we're using uh, industrial-grade drones. They're very safe by uh, DJI. You mm-hmm. probably have a DJI drone. That's exactly what I have. One. Yeah, well, ours is a bit bigger. It's like a private in a, in a truck. And DJI to date sold millions of drones without a single casualty. Uh, if you compare that to cars, that's, you know, so much safer. And by delivering with drones, I'm actually taking cars, scooters, and trucks off the road. True. So I'm actually saving lives by going to drones. Sold. Yeah, <laughs> we got the pitch. Yeah, I didn't how see that people, one coming. Yeah. <laughs> how, how, can we, how can people see this in action? Are there any videos online? So on flytex.com, on our... Uh, Facebook page on our uh, YouTube cha- channel, you can see uh, a few videos that we've made. And actually, I expect that now we'll start we'll start deploying um, um, a bigger project in uh, in Reykjavik, and we'll start deploying in North Carolina. I expect that you'll start seeing you know consumers or actual people who use the service uploading videos of them receiving the packages. Yeah, exactly. I have the problem. I have the problem. If a burger is flying about a hundred meters over my head, mm-hmm. won't it get colder faster? Well, we deliver it within like four or five minutes. It doesn't have a chance to get colder. So it's, it's, you know, we're flying 50 kilometers in a straight line directly to you. It's hey, so Domino's much faster. pizza's uh, promise for 30 minutes suddenly sounds very lame. Yeah, it does sound lame. A whole new world of opportunities mm-hmm. now. Now, if you can order, uh, you know, you have two options, sushi that will arrive within an hour and a half or a sushi plate that will arrive within 15 minutes, 20 minutes. Uh, you're not going to, you know, I'm, make sense hungry. To I'm exactly. a hungry person. I have exactly. kids. They want it now. <laughs> and Yerif, how, how did you end up thinking of this idea? How did this happen? Uh, so as I was phasing of day-to-day activity in Space AL, Amit, who was my flatmate a few years before that, uh, was phasing out of his startup as well, and he started playing with drones. And, he, you know, he contacted me and he told me, I'm playing with drones. Do you want to, you know, join me in playing? And the first product that we've developed was a, a GPS tracker for drones in real time. And for the first two years of flight tracks, we didn't raise any funds. We bootstrapped the entire operation. We ended up selling more than 20,000 units in 70 countries, made in those two years almost $1 million in revenues. Hmm. It was a nice business. Uh, but then we realized that the killer application for drones is going to be on-demand delivery. Uh, How? Mean, How did you realize that? Well, when you think about it, in, in a few years from now, uh, once the, uh, I don't know, the iPhone 14 is out, uh, if you'll be able to order it and receive it on next day, or you'll be able to order and receive it within 20 minutes for the same delivery price, there's really no point in, in doing next day delivery. But you had the GPS drone business and it was doing very well. It was doing nicely. I mean, it was, uh, you know, ramen soup profitable. Uh, it's a hardware business, so most of the uh, it's a, it's a term. <laughs> so I didn't know that term. That surprised me. I like that. I'm gonna so, use that. So basically, uh, you know, when you're doing hardware, a lot of, of of your revenues go into producing the hardware itself, packaging it, uh, selling it, receiving back. You know, uh, the f- defects or people are unhappy with the product. It's uh, very different than a SaaS company. Yes. Which do you have any experience in or just as a compar- general comparison? As a general comparison, uh, Flytrex today is more about the software than the hardware itself. Oh, you're saying Flytrex is more like a SaaS company? Uh, no, the, uh, we're not exactly. We're like, uh, you can say that we're a platform today. So you wanted to make a shift from uh, dealing with hardware uh, to shift uh, to d- dealing with platforms? Uh, to dealing with drone deliveries and finding the, the exact 
a position where we should be to 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 help companies solve their own demand problems mm-hmm. okay and it's uh you know it sounds very simple but it's oh it does not sound very simple <laughs> <laughs> there, it's like there's nothing simple about this it sounds very technological it sounds like very sophisticated uh and it sounds like a great challenge to even penetrate that market especially since amazon have been talking about that for years oh uh, amazon are not I'm, i'm not competing with amazon how come The, the, you know they're gonna educate the market they're gonna enable the market and eventually they're gonna solve that problem for Amazon customers ordering from the Amazon platform and delivering stuff from Amazon warehouses any other retailer would need a similar solution now it's not like AWS uh, Amazon's logo or slogan is building the the largest or greatest store in the world they're not gonna give that advantage to other stores they're gonna keep that to their stores and Uh, so basically any other retailer would need a similar solution right smart uh, and what led you to this in general uh, so after two years of you know being in the uh, drone industry when we entered the drone industry we weren't really sure what's going to be the killer application but after two years we you know we started thinking about what's going to be the, the the largest market that drones are going to tackle and by far it's 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 delivery and So you were within the landscape and then you you knew it better from the inside exactly so you were able to identify the opportunity there mm-hmm. and then you just uh, made the shift yep uh, we, we don't call it a pivot we call it evolution because we already had a, a system capable of receiving telemetry in real time from drones mm-hmm. so now we have to control so them it was as well. almost natural uh, yep, sort of <laughs> <laughs> got it what do you find like that's more more challenging a lot of people that we talk to are talking about the challenge of the Uh, uh, regulation um, law enforcement uh, um, law in general and there's also the technology side so it's always the sexy side is the technology side but sometimes the biggest challenge for them I don't know about you guys is the regu- regulation um, you know it's like generally the cock block of a lot of startups that if they don't pass that stage sometimes it kills like yeah. a lot of great startups just killed by small legal issues. That's why we uh, you know from day one we said our, our main KPI is flights uh, I, I'm not waiting for the US market to open up even though now we've one of 10 pilots approved by the FAA uh, so that's why we went to Iceland uh, we also have a small operation in uh, Costa Rica as well uh, that we still haven't released too much information about and we from day one we said okay we want to be there we want to be ready once the, uh, the you know the North American and European West European market opens up That's the real market mm-hmm. but my my KPI for the uh, for the short and medium term is going to be flights how many flights have I performed uh, and that way we you can tackle a bit the uh, the regulatory uh, barrier uh, so it's I don't like remember proof of, proof of concept uh, it's more than that it's it's optimizing the process optimizing your sys- the, the system the cloud the drones themselves the operations the uh, interfaces with your clients and with the restaurants or, or retailers and everything has to be uh, worked out uh, including the business model the pricing so once the uh, the real market opens up I'll be in a much better position than anyone else so it's like a, you, you choose your your strategic sandbox exactly but I would guess that after dealing with the uh, much larger regulators uh, trying working on sending a spaceship to the moon this is probably like a walk in the park right so not exactly uh, spacecrafts have been launched so it's a known process hmm. Uh, drones that's a new realm uh, for most of the regulators they uh, you know they're looking a bit to the right and left seeing what other regulators are doing at the end I'm I don't talk against them I walk with them it's it's my role as well as theirs to make sure that both the skies and people on the ground stay safe uh, so they have to feel uh, that you know they can uh, go to sleep at night and, and trust you and you know and that everything will be okay and And that's also something you know sometimes in, in uh, our VPR and Vadim says that he doesn't care you know we have to stand by regulations but the, at the end besides the uh, regulatory framework he wants to feel himself that he can go st- you know he can sleep call me at night so it's sometimes you have to do a bit more than what the regulator asks you so that you'll feel safe as well uh, and dealing with the uh, regulators before uh, such a large scale uh, mm-hmm. in space IL do you feel that helped you develop some skills or is this a completely new ground? Uh, it, it's very different it's very different uh, because at space air it was more about okay that's the uh, that's the book we have to fill 
And over here, it's more of a discussion. It's a step-by-step -step process. In Iceland, we didn't start flying all over the city near the airport. We started by doing one route between two points, landing on the other side with an operator, with our operator, our partner's operator on the other side, approving the landing. And as we've progressed, now, now they allow us to deliver to, uh, to people, you know, directly to consumers and in the next few months to uh, a lot of backyards. In, uh, what about weather? Reykjavik. So that's a great question. Our current drone can't fly in the rain. The next one that we're and already evaluating. Island. Yeah. So the next one that we're already evaluating can carry further, you know, more weight, further distances and fly in really heavy rains. Wow. And the nice thing was that I don't have to do a thing about it. DJI developed it for, you know, whoever wants it and I just buy it. Wow. How does it fly through rain? It's, uh, it's sealed. Oh, okay. <laughs> it's got a little umbrella. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and I noticed we were talking about Space IL. Let's explain for a second. Like, can you explain to us what Space IL is? Because I think it's... Mm -hmm. So Space IL is, is an Israeli not-for-profit. We're an educational not-for-profit. Our mission is sending an unmanned spacecraft to the moon, making Israel the fourth nation to softly land on the moon. But the vision is, is impacting a generation. We're an educational not-for-profit. And our goal is that by the time we land on the moon, every kid in Israel will be able to explain his parents what the spacecraft is, is doing. And we didn't invent that. During the 60s, it was called the Apollo effect. Mm -hmm. uh, apparently, kid went, kids went in increasing numbers to become engineers and scientists. Back then, it was a side effect of the Cold War. Uh, for us, that's our goal. We, we've met with hundreds of thousands of kids. We're working on a nationwide program. And, you know, 10 years from now, I, I want kids to explain, to tell me that they went into engineering school because they, they got excited from space air. How does a person wake up one morning and decide that they're going to send the spaceship to the moon in order to inspire a generation? So uh, it didn't happen in the morning. It happened in the evening after a lot of whiskey. Uh, back then, I was working for the uh, Israeli Minister of Defense. I was uh, a team leader in doing, you know, hardcore engineering. And I was also the co-founder of Machanet. Machanet is the Israeli creativity camp for uh, the Israeli defense and security services. And every year we, you know, we had like a main project for the camp. And back in 2010, we brought Shimon Peres to the camp. It was, you know, back then it was, it was the president. And then I asked myself, okay, well, what's the, uh, the technological project that we want to do next year? And the idea that I thought was of, was of, uh, building a rocket that will reach the edge of space hmm. uh, will release a small plastic spacecraft, like, you know, an X-Wing or something like that, and, you know, record a video of it hmm. and call it the first Israeli spacecraft. Uh, the, the camp happens in an Air Force base, so, you know... I, and this I, was as a challenge or... Uh, just as a, for fun? you know, as a fun project hmm. during weekends. And... Uh, everything happened in an Air Force base, so I said, okay, it's probably easier to receive permits to do that from the military than, uh, than, civil, than the Civil Aviation Authority. And uh, I went to a friend's house, and after a few glasses of whiskey, I, I told him about my uh, idea for the main project for Machanet next year. And he told me, ah, you're not thinking big enough. <laughs> and I asked him, what, are you talking about the CubeSat, a nanosatellite? That's a satellite that's about... 10 by 10 by 10 centimeters, weighs about a kilo, costs the order of six figures, lower six figures in dollars. I told him, ah, it's too expensive for the camp. And he told me, no, what about the Google Honor X Prize, sending a spacecraft to the moon? I heard about the competition, and I told him, ah, you're crazy. What's that? What's the competition? So the uh, back in 2008, I think, Google started a competition called the Google Honor X Prize competition. The goal was to send an unmanned spacecraft to the moon, land it, travel 500 meters, and transmit back images or videos of the landing and the, uh, the journey on the moon. And the first prize for the first team that does that was $20 million. Uh, back then, there were, I think, more than 30 teams registered, already registered. And when uh, my friend told me about the competition, uh, it was in November 2010. Registration was opened until December 31st. Like it was open for something like three years. And I told him, ah, you're crazy. Uh, but uh, Ilan lives uh, lived nearby where I used to live and in Tel Aviv. And uh, as I strolled the streets of Tel Aviv back home, like around midnight, 
I asked myself, well, how should I name the Israeli team? Uh, <laughs> I thought about Space IL, as in Space Israel, or Space Illinois. And <laughs> when I got home, I registered the Space IL domain name. Uh, I posted on Facebook who wants to go to the moon. And I emailed Jonathan, who was a friend of mine. Uh, he worked for the Israeli Aerospace Industries for the Space Division. And I wrote him, listen, remember my rocket idea? I have a crazier one. Let's, let's meet. And after the day after Kfir was a Facebook friend of mine, uh, wrote me back, well, if you're serious about the Moon Project, I'm in. And the three of us met in a pub in Hulon and started uh, charting our way towards the Moon. Wow. Uh, and are we there yet? Almost. Almost. How many years since then? Almost Ten? eight now. Eight. This was in 2008? The end of 2010. End of 2010. Uh, and so are you going to win the competition? So after extending the uh, competition's deadline for a few years, Google, you know, they saw that nobody is making a real progress, so they decided to terminate the competition. So there's really no competition now. Uh, there's no prize money, at least. But even if there was, I mean, how much does it cost to send the spaceship uh, to the moon? Almost $100 million. So the $20 million prize that they're offering is, uh, the, uh, the doesn't field, really help. Yeah. Now, it's, uh, the, the XPRIZE Foundation, the, the prize has never covered the, uh, the actual expense, expenses. Did they know? But, Did you know in advance? Uh, no. We, at the beginning, we thought it's going to cost less than $10 million. Nice. Yeah. Uh, we apparently we were a bit uh, under budget. What's so, so expensive about sending, like, I know, I know you know. So <laughs> just so the launch costs, uh, let's say, in the area of $10 million. Uh, everything is expensive. Just the fueling, fueling the spacecraft costs like six figures in dollars, or almost a million dollars. I understand that. But so, and then what? what's expensive after that? Uh, the, the launcher itself. A complete launch costs somewhere in the area of $60 million, at least, with the SpaceX. Uh, we buy a part of the launch, so there are contractors in the middle. That, you know, when you say launch, launch, what does that mean? Like, what, what's the launch? The rocket. The SpaceX rocket. The, the rocket itself. That puts okay. you in orbit around Earth. So you thought this is going to cost $10 million. Did you leave a full-time job to join SpaceIL? To, uh, to yes, found I did. Space you did. And you thought it was going to cost you $10 million? And you thought, I'm going to make a nice profit because I'm going to win $20 uh, No, it's, it's a not-for-profit. So there's actually there's no equity. There's, uh, the founders don't get anything besides. The so theory. there's going to be a lot of people who want to be scientists in Israel after, yeah, after a while. Yeah, That's I, a I, good motivation. Yeah, okay. Fair enough. And still... Uh, you thought that you're going to be able to at least cover expenses. I mean, you, you had this sort mm-hmm. of a business plan in mind and you left a full-time job for it. Yep. Uh, and then what, when was that point in time when you realized this is not going to cost $10 million? So it was a step-by-step. I, I used to have a graph that shows how much we think this, this, the project would cost uh, in terms of timeline. And every, you know, every quarterly meeting or every half a year, we updated the, uh, the timeline and the, the budget and the spacecraft size. So we saw that this is, you know, beginning to, to grow a bit. And that's a, quite a challenge. Like, th- did you feel like maybe this is not going to work out? Uh, so as long as I had, you know, people who believed in the project and were willing to support, uh, we, uh, you know, we, we just didn't stop. But it's weren't you scared? Years. Didn't you feel like maybe this is spinning out of control? That this is becoming too big and you don't know how much it's going to cost and or, or how you're going to fund it and people are looking up to you and waiting for this promise? Uh, no, I didn't think about that. At all? I was thinking, okay, we have a, we have a deadline. We have, you know, a, a mission to accomplish. Uh, this is the best timeline that I can give today. That's the best budget that we can, you know, estimate. And we have to update that as we go. It's, uh, when, when we just got started, the, uh, we approached a few uh, serious people. Uh, people like uh, the chairman of the Israeli Space Agency, uh, Professor Yitzhak Ben Israel. Yeah. Or the president of the Weizmann Institute, Professor Daniel Zeifman. And they all told us the same thing. Guys, we don't think that that's going to be the budget or the, the timeline. They knew. Uh, yeah. What Google didn't. So Google didn't really care. Okay. Uh, Google, that, you know, the X-Files doesn't pay you up anything in advance. Yeah, they literally want you to uh, have a moonshot the goal. They put a moonshot mm-hmm. goal and they said, humanity, we're putting this out there. Somebody go. The first one it. that manages to land the moon, let us know. It's not that simple, <laughs> but let us know, and there's a price for that. And you felt like you can do this. You were confident, and you were comfortable raising funds for this. Yeah, I thought. I still think that this is, you know, something that I can accomplish. So, how did you get in that confidence? How did you know? Uh, I mean, you must have had some doubts. 
So, you know, it's a problem that has been solved on a bigger scale with more funds, but it was the first time it was solved was back in the 60s. The By first countries? Yep. Not like a one-man show. Yeah, it's, you know, the the, uh, the distance between countries and individuals is, is always shrinking. Huh. Today you've got billionaires, uh, you know, have the, that have their own space projects. Uh, so it's always shrinking and uh, it didn't look that, it looked, of course, complex, but it didn't look out of, just, you know, out of reach. Real Life Superpowers doesn't do the whole sponsorship thing, but we do like to holler about awesome ideas and things that are useful. So great job, quality time app. No, I don't know if you know this, but I've been using Instagram about half an hour a day, and I put a timer for 10 minutes a day. So 20, out for you? 20 minutes accumulated of more time doing anything more efficient than going into Instagram. No offense, Instagram is great for me. So great job, guys. Um, Download it too, then. Yeah, great idea. You're actually saying something that logical. You said if someone else did it, it was a while back. Mm-hmm. Why There's a reason I? why can't I uh, do it. Mm-hmm. Was that logical. always your mindset, even as a child? Uh, that's a good question. I'm not really sure. Not sure. Like, do you remember times in your life where you felt uh, a bit overwhelmed by something that you wanted to achieve? So I think that that's how I filter things uh, in advance. You know, if I, hmm. okay, can I do it or not? Can I? You can, you know, today you can research everything and then you can have a sense of, is this something I can accomplish or not? Was there ever a technological challenge that uh, you put your mind to and you thought this would be amazing for me to achieve, but mm-hmm. I don't think I can? Yes. There was. I don't fixing, mean sci-fi. Fixing spinal cord injuries. <laughs> right. Yeah, that's something. Uh, I've, I've researched that and uh, unfortunately we, we're still not there. And this is something, uh, so you, about a year and a half ago was this? Yeah, back in March uh, 2017. So you were skiing? I was and... snowboarding. With the, uh, we've been snowboarding the same group for like 15 years. Never had, you know, nobody broke a finger. And I was uh, just uh, bad luck. I found myself landing with my back on a rock. And I just uh, broke my uh, broke my uh, spine and cut my spinal cord. And since then, I've been uh, using a wheelchair. Yeah, and I, I remember the moment that I found out that this happened to you. And I remember uh, I saw that on a Facebook post. And I found mm-hmm. myself reading this like 10 times, trying to find out if you're maybe kidding. Yeah. Uh, because I remember you told an entire story about a ski trip and something that happened. And you just finished it uh with uh so for for the time being i have to say goodbye to my legs oh, it wasn't for the time being so it was from now on you said that you yeah. see i can't even comprehend that yeah, even, a lot of, a lot of people told me yeah, i thought it was uh, temporary i don't know i, I wrote from now on because knowing you it just doesn't make sense because you're the guy who who literally the phrase impossible is nothing is about you <laughs> because you you just say you do whatever you set your mind to and then i remember uh following you uh and seeing I'm um, being amazed to see that you are not stopping. So the, uh, when, I, when, I, when I fell and you know, broke my back, I, I stayed conscious. And I immediately knew that, you know, in my head I said, okay, it's either temporary or, or, or fixed. I have no way of knowing. Okay. Uh, I, uh, I faded out in the helicopter on my, my way to the hospital. And Did I, they find you quickly? Uh, so I, I was snowboarding with friends, but I was the last one. So they, you know, we... We were quite experienced, so experienced. So we wait downstairs to everyone else. So there wasn't a time when you were just alone there. I was the alone there. I was like, okay, I just stopped feeling half of my body, and I was like, okay, what the fuck just happened? Huh. And I just sent my hand, and I started taking it down to see where my body ends because I stopped feeling it. And I said, okay, everything is here, but I and can't feel it. I can't feel it. I'm, 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 you know, I'm on my back in a good position. I wasn't twisted or anything. My left hand, I didn't feel it as well because uh, I broke a lot of ribs, so it pressed, pressed on a few nerves. And I found my hand there, connected and everything. And I was like, okay, all my friends were in front of me while snowboarding. I need to be found. So I just raised my, my right hand that worked and started screaming. In like half a minute, a minute, two British guys just stopped next to me. Did you right think you're going to die? No, I didn't think, I, I didn't think about it. Uh, I just thought that, okay, once I was found, I know I'm not alone and, you know, I'm going to get the best treatment possible. I'm in France, not in, you know, East Europe or something like that. So that yeah. was, uh, you know, in my head, I was like, okay, there's at least that. 
and you know the the ski patrol came and after that one of my uh, friends who was skiing with us uh is a pediatrician like a kid's doctor yeah and he was like the first one from the israeli group that got to me and he was like okay what's wrong and i told him danny i, I can't feel my legs and he was like you know do you feel me touching you and he you know just pressed pressed me uh, pressed really hard and i didn't feel a thing and he was like okay <laughs> so what goes on in your mind in those moments that uh, you also have a wife and two children back home so back then i i you know it was a lot of adrenaline so yeah. i didn't have that in mind i was like okay i was found i'm in good hands i'm gonna get the best treatment that i can i can't do anything about it currently just be relaxed and and wait to see what happens Was there a time period that would have helped like if it would have happened faster? no no um, but I just yeah, I told like my, it was all very my fast. completely yeah, those, like in a snap yep yeah. your spine mm-hmm. wow. so uh, I faded out in the helicopter basically I, I woke up after six days in in Ichilov, the hospital. After, in Israel I, I was medically seduced uh, in a medically seduced coma for two days in Grenoble in France I was then operated there my wife came Noah and then I was like I seduced for a few more days while I was in France recovering and I basically woke up in Ichilov and I you know I saw uh, with my right hand at work that left was very very weak I saw that I got she's like right now fine right uh, yeah, yeah she's fine just took the no hand I mean your hand yeah it took, took yeah. it just uh, some time to recover okay I saw so many messages of people you know <laughs> what what happened we had rumors are you okay are you alive? And I was like, okay, I'm not going to answer any, you know, each one of these on, on the road. Fair enough. Uh, the best way to do that would be a Facebook pay, uh, wow. post. And I, uh, it was too weak to, uh, to write the, the entire post myself. So I just gave my wife my phone. My father was there as well. And I you know, told her, okay, I have, an, uh, I have the message in my head, start typing. And they were like, are you serious? Do you really want us to post that? <laughs> And I was like, yes. Yeah, that's the question I was asking myself reading it. Is he serious? So, but this, what goes on in your mind in those days? Like, you're a very ambitious person. You're very, you have a very full life. You're always on the go. You're always doing. You're always aspiring. Was that crushed in any way? Um, no. I, I, in my mind was, uh, my, uh, my mindset was okay. Uh, I need to learn how to live with that. Uh, maybe solve it down the road but currently I have to learn how to live with that I have to be strong because I want my family to be strong as well and I you know I, I'm, I've got the work that I love and my life that I love and my, my family of course so I, I want to get back to that as fast as possible so how long did it take to to actually do that because it's half a year <laughs> half a year uh, I was in the uh, neurological rehabilitation department in uh, Tel Shomer for almost half a year Uh, amazing team really wow crazy crazy people I uh, they're really supportive and they teach you everything you have to and they they push you and uh, I actually made a few friends from the uh, <laughs> from the medical team there and uh, you learn to do everything uh, from you know from scratch uh, to make sure that you you can be independent in the wheelchair you You, you know what I, I love about what you're, you're saying I'm sorry there's, there's mm-hmm. this one sentence that you said listen I'll maybe solve it down the road like you said that also uh, when you're talking about space IL and you said that also when you're talking about mm-hmm. um, um, uh, um, uh, what's interesting about that is you, you like this is what you do you solve problems like you, you, okay. I, were you were you always like solving problems uh, yes. to other people are you the eldest? Uh, the eldest in, like, in the family uh, but I, we're two brothers so I'm the uh, the older one okay so but problem solving how do you get to that though uh, I love that so it was a challenge and you want to solve it I try to have one challenge at a time so I don't usually why to do that uh, because you want to you know dive into the problem and be in the mindset of that problem like is it impossible to, to solve two problems yeah Uh, depending on the the size of the of the problem I mean being a CEO of the of a company you you, you know you solve a lot of problems simultaneously but it's all in a mindset of I'm doing drone deliveries now what do we have to do to make sure that the drones are flying everything you have to do is clear the path to that if I have now another problem which is spinal cord injuries that's a very different track so I But you didn't stop to focus only on the spinal cord injury except for that time frame where you had 
to be in hospital? So even in hospital, I, I was, you know, I, I, I was full-time at flight tax. And you also had Space Air in the background. So, so Space Air, they don't need me on a day-to-day -day basis. And board meetings, parties, things like that. <laughs> it was a, we had an amazing CEO. We, we have now a new one in uh, Space Air, so they don't really need me. And Flytrex, I meet my partner, was the CEO of his last company. So uh, managed to cover for everything that I've missed. Uh, but after like uh, two weeks or something like that, I already had my laptop. And in the hospital yeah with yeah. one hand and one sort of working yes and then you know i started bringing the team to, uh, to my <laughs> to hospital, hospital bed yes, oh my god to do uh, team meetings and then i started going out for a few hours every day the rehab department that's the uh, like go out as much as much as, as you can you know, they want to you know make sure that you return to your day life and it didn't life. have to tell you twice nope <laughs> so you did so the first few times were like uh, i had to go in a special van with like a, an elevator that puts you down and takes you up. And I was like, no, no, that's uh, that's too much of a hassle. And then you learn how to hop into a car from your wheelchair. And... Do you feel like uh, you've mastered this skill completely by now? Oh, no, 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 really not. But it's not something that I'm looking forward to master. Uh, it's like, you know, I, I was pretty good at snowboarding. Uh, 98% of the time I was, I was okay, apparently. So it's a bit like that in uh, wheelchairs. I, I'm not, you're not going to see me hopping, you know, <laughs> stairs or anything like that. I, uh, I've had enough <laughs> of my share of accidents. Uh, I need to master it to a level where I, I can do, I don't feel that it limits me. Of course it does, like I, I can't climb stairs. Yeah. Um, but on a day-to-day -day basis, I, I can do most of the other things on my own. So it really doesn't limit you to push forward at the moment what you mm -hmm. need and want. It does make uh, air travel a bit harder, but besides yeah. that... But are you coping with that? Do you still... Ah, yeah, as much three as weeks did? after the, the hospital, I was already in New York and then, uh, <laughs> of course you then were. the valley. Of three weeks after? Were. Yeah. That's amazing. <laughs> it's, uh, we had like one day in New York with seven meetings and we just, you know, hopped from one Uber to the next. So that was like a good... Uh, <laughs> and you returned to the hospital, right? You're basically there. No, no, three weeks after I got released from the hospital. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, Actually, I wanted, I was invited sense. to give a lecture in, in Paris, like two or three months uh, after the injury. And now my wife convinced me that, you know, I, I said, ah, let's, we'll leave the hospital for a few days and we'll just go to France <laughs> and come back. She was like, no, no, don't, don't play with that. Stay in the hospital. Was that like the first time in your life where you were stopped for real? Ah, no, no, not really. No. Okay. So like, when else? Uh, I don't know. Yeah. But, you know, usually with small, stupid ideas. Okay. Small, stupid ideas that you're glad that you didn't do. But like, uh, I, you know, you never know what, what would have happened if I'd done them. But uh... Were you, were, uh, are you an entrepreneur of all your life? Like, what was it like your first... Uh... I, I actually worked for the government for almost a decade. So, uh, you know, I was one of the guys who, my, in the technology department, that always loved to push forward and come up with new ideas. So you can say that I was an entrepreneur within the, uh, you know, as a government employee. But, Which is impossible. Uh, yeah, exactly. Employeepreneur. Hmm? Employeepreneur. Employeepreneur. No, I, we actually had uh, the uh, the unit manager was, you know, he was an amazing guy and he, he was all, all for, you know, giving people a lot of chances to uh, to work on their, their own projects. If you wanted to do uh, something, you know, on your own, you could stay in the, you know, the evenings, nights and work on whatever you wanted. Uh, they really gave gave me a free hand to do uh, whatever, I, almost whatever I wanted. Most successful entrepreneurs have like an aspiration, like an inspiring figure, which was an ex boss or a partner. Like, do you have anything like that? Um, not one. I think I had, you know, I had a few. Uh, I think it's a more about where I was than not with whom I was. I, I mean, I was with a few amazing people. But like in the uh, military, I, I was actually in a special forces unit in the artillery corps. And over there, I learned that I can, you know, I can walk 60 kilometers, 40 miles a night without sleeping and, and continue functioning. I can climb hills, ropes, carry people on my back. So I learned a lot about what I can do as a, as a human being. And then working for the government, I, I mean, it was an amazing place. We, uh, Really, if there's another place that can build a spacecraft, that's uh, where, where I walked. So uh, you find yourself surrounded by, by people who don't think that there's anything that can stop them. So that must have been helpful to set that mindset. 
yes. <laughs> so the, part of me I'm sure is like to also understand um, what's your uniqueness, like what's your superpower. And, and, and I'm listening to you, and I'm, I'm trying to think. Uh, like, what, what do you what do you think it is? Um, not letting pessimism take me down. Keeping uh, the right spirit, trying to solve a problem. Rosh Bakir, Nibu, how would you yeah, say that in yeah. English? I'm, 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 I actually, I don't know what the translation is, but but that's exactly what it is. Persistence. But it's uh, it's like persistence is up to a point that it almost looks silly. Mm-hmm. You know, at the beginning with Space AL, nine out of ten people that we've met, both philanthropists and space engineers, told us that it can't be done in Israel. You know, Steve Jobs said that famous quote of those who are crazy enough to think they can change the world are the mm-hmm. ones who actually do it. Yeah. Uh, yeah, you could say that. No, but that's exactly what I thought. Like, I think the, the, the general idea even surrounds himself with super optimists. It's, it's super optimism. It's, it's Yeah, it, it drives solving. like wife crazy. She's not like that. <laughs> <laughs> like, you, like, you're always thinking you can solve the power problem. You're going with people who are, who are persistent, but also... think they you know they're optimist as well so mm-hmm. they, they, they continue to do whatever they do because they know there's an end game at the end like even sometimes you don't even like you know, from what you told uh, us right now you don't visualize the end game yet right like I do sometimes... I have uh, like a very vague visualization of you know lots of drones flying delivering goods in real time but I uh, and I can even you know start working on the details but, but that wasn't if... day one on day one you didn't imagine those drones flying Or, or um, did you I did but you know the uh, the details the, the vision doesn't change the details does do mm-hmm. uh, the spacecraft grew up a lot since we we started the project uh, uh, flight X we, we've you know we've uh, f- you know fine-tuned the uh, the solution so much and I'm pretty sure that in a year from now the uh, if I start looking at the details of my vision the details would be different mm-hmm. we'd be using it has to be agile. you're you're creating something mm-hmm. from nothing that's that's special and I think uh, people That's... can learn a lot from this uh, just you know if you have an idea and you believe in your idea uh, don't let anything stop you but it's not blind faith it's based on you know intuition engineer in my case engineering intu- intuition about looking at what was done and how much it costs and, and Yeah, that's what Just, I'm actually thinking right now that there has to be some sort of balance because you have exactly. to always know there has to be a point where you have to realize this is delusional uh, and that a, happens it has to happen there's a nice sentence that I've heard if you're not making a salary out of that it's it's not your profession it's your hobby right I think I also heard that said with respect to maybe three years if you've been doing it for three years and you're not earning it's not a profession it's a hobby. No, but I think I think what's really uh, when, when he says intuition all of the ideas that we talked about right now he said uh, I'm sorry but for yeah. phrasing what you said but uh, if they landed on the moon in 1960 I can probably do it if Amazon is sending drones out there uh, I can probably do it because I have the know-how of the technicality and the reference so, point and so, the reference point so it's yes a reality no. okay yeah, it's, it's yes and no I mean nuclear reactors have been with us since the 50s and Right. Can you can you build a nuclear reactor back in your you know in your backyard? Well, I, I can't build a bed from IKEA but, but <laughs> hypothetically I understand So space saying. technology uh, is one of those technology that has been uh, part of it on purpose has, has been you know stayed in the shadows in the governmental realm. Uh, so uh, it, well actually there are a few companies, Startups that are now doing nuclear reactors, so even that is not. <laughs> <laughs> He feels bad now. We can't show up. I go to Google, <laughs> nuclear reactor, build it. Five, five easy steps. Five easy steps, yeah. Uh, YouTube channel. Right, right. right. But, but the benchmark helps, helps actually to make it, you know, a reality. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, optimism helps to push it every day. Yeah, completely. You have to be optimistic otherwise. Is there an entrepreneur that, like, like... If he's not optimistic he can succeed is there such a thing so there's another nice sentence I mean expect for the best and prepare for the worst right so on one hand you have to make you know you have to believe that you're going to make it on the other hand you have to you know cover all the bases to make sure that you know you have to stay of, grounded. At, at the end of, of what a lot of what I do as a CEO is reading legal documents yeah yep yeah, it's not that fun but it's you know I understand that I need that yeah in order to succeed to make sure that All the bases are covered.
And so the fact that you're optimistic and that uh, you don't let anything stop you doesn't mean that you don't understand that there's going to be a lot of hard work and, mm -hmm. uh, you know, just... If we, let's hustling. say, we, we test a new hardware device, never order one, order two or three units because you're going to break the first one. And I don't want that to stop you for a few weeks until you get a new, a, a new one. So we order, unless it's really prohibitively expensive and then we only order one and, you know, dear Balak... <laughs> Make sure you don't break it, but otherwise... So believe, but validate. Uh, yeah. Do you always have a fallback? Yeah, I always, you know, in my mind, I can, you know, if everything fails, I can also, I can always go back and be an engineer somewhere. No, but I mean, they get in a fallback in a meaning, I have a plan A for this. Yeah, and, always. And if that doesn't work, there's a plan B. If not, there's a plan C. Mm -hmm. Are you always like playing with that? Yeah, always. Yeah, you can put all your eggs in one basket. But you did just say that you know you can always fall back to be an engineer, meaning that, meaning that you always know that there is that chance that whatever you're trying will not work out. If plan A, B, and C won't, won't work out and we'll run out of money. So, yeah, there's always But that's that in mind because some people say, no, that's not an option. Uh, there's nothing that's not an option. I mean, yeah, you, can't, you can't really know. Especially when your aspiration is to do yes. automatic drones and yeah. delivering them and, Those you know, deals. spacecrafts, automatic spacecrafts to the moon. You know, it becomes it becomes more logical to think that maybe 1% of a chance. Absolutely. Like, it's you just know, the, if, it's if, just... You want, if you want God to laugh, tell him your plans. That's the, you know, the same. Right. Yeah. Just a really interesting to see different narratives that people tell themselves. Because one entrepreneur will say, I have one game, one end game, and it's not an option to fail. And that's what I tell myself. And it's just not. So um, it depends. At I'm the more end, in your, if nobody is uh, if nobody is willing to to pay you to do that, in the entire world you can't get someone to invest in you. Then, uh, man, you 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 know Good it's luck. a nice hobby. Yeah. yeah. And and what's your end game? Like, where do you want to see yourself? Uh, making a dent in the world. In the universe, maybe I, I make a dent. I don't know. Maybe making a few dents. <laughs> <laughs> And, and, and space sail is a sort of one. Flight X is a second. It's not sort of one. I think it is one. When are we going to be on the moon? Uh, currently, it's February 13th, 2019. Uh, if the launch would be will postpone, be postponed from December to January, it might uh, skip a month to uh, March. And knowing you, that's going to be a nice dent, but that's going to still be just where you are mm -hmm. at that moment, and you're still going to keep wanting to grow and create other dents, right? Yeah, of course. Where does that hunger come from? Why do you want to make a few dents? Why is not one dent enough? Uh, that's a good question. I, I love solving problems. I love solving big, big problems. So, you know, that's... And if I'm making a dent, it means the problem was big enough. That's true. Although you want to change... The dent has to... Like, if you think of it logically, you want the dent to be not a dent yeah, to, uh... and solving a real problem. But... So, so, first of all, thanks so much for your time. Thanks for having me. Yeah, of course. Uh, it was a pleasure. Um, one of the things I took from this conversation, I was someone else did, is something about uh, the motion, that you're always on motion, you always have something that you're working on, the persistence you have and the optimism um, as a feature. Optimism, I think, I think also saved your day-to-day uh, because mm -hmm. if you weren't optimistic, it's easy in a few points in life. I'm not even talking about the crucial snowboarding point, but it's easy to go to that place where you're saying, okay, I'm going to be an engineer. I'm going, you know, to my normal, whatever I do, because like, I'm talented. I, I don't want to and... deal with the stress. Yeah. Like I, I, I'm super talented. I was talented before I was successful before, and I still want to go to those challenges because he's optimistic that that dent is going to happen. And those as big aspirations of big businesses. It's, it's not opening up a franchise, you know, burgers, which is amazing, but it's doing things. That's that also are, a, a, very, life. No, yeah, a big challenge. By big way. challenge. <laughs> I didn't mean to. Doing a restaurant, it. especially in places like New York or Tel Aviv. That's, that's no, no, I didn't mean that. In this I'm not sure that I can tackle such a challenge. <laughs> <laughs> in fact, but aspirations of moon where there's only several people to do that. Uh, I think that's super impressive. And if you weren't optimistic that I can't, you couldn't believe that that can mm -hmm. happen without that. So uh, thanks for that. And thank you. Thank you for your time. This was a pleasure. Yeah, thanks, guys. Uh, we can't wait to see the moon landing and where you go next. And mm -hmm. if I can go to the moon myself, I'd happily yeah. do that. Like if uh, I could just uh, tag along to that space. Well, it's an unmanned spacecraft on a one-way mission. So uh, I'm not sure that you are. Uh... No, I'm not in for one-way Maybe the next project that you're Two-way mission, I'm in. Can you hold your breath for a month or so? 
I'll work we'll on it. 40, 42 seconds right now is my. <laughs> I'll work on it. So, uh, just to your sub- subscribers and listeners, don't forget to uh, like us on Facebook, both spaceail.com and uh, flightrex.com. Yeah, do that, people. All right. Bye bye. Real life. Superpowers. Technology. It's alive! Real. Live. Superpowers.